So hi, um, I'm Anand, and that's Kumar, and uh, we are the co-founders of a company called Crisp, and we have come all the way from downtown San Francisco. Um, all right, so what do we do? We do strong authentication using sensor data and any other available context. So we all know that there are problems with passwords, and you know we've known that for some time now. Uh, but the existing, the alternatives, your biometrics and one-time passcodes, there's one major problem that they have, and that is users just don't seem to be using them, especially in the consumer setting. So if you want to have a real impact, whatever strong authentication method you use really needs to work for all users. Uh, so not just the ones that you happen to convince to jump through hoops. Uh, and it's, it's actually those other users that you really need to worry about, because chances are they are the ones that are using weak passwords and reusing passwords across services and so on. Secondly, it needs to work for all devices, desktops, tablets, laptops, smartphones, regardless of whether they have a fingerprint reader on them or not. And finally, it, it needs to work, play nice with all your existing methods because you really want to be able to introduce this gradually without taking on much operational risk. So you know, whatever your innovation department says, uh, the reality is you're not going to be suddenly replacing your existing methods with selfies or, or whatever. So um, in general, it is incredibly hard to change uh, or force users to change how they log in. But what you can do is change how you verify them. So, and this is where the context comes in. So you have location-related context. Now, most solutions, when they say they use context, usually stop here. But there's a lot you can learn from the device as well. So this is like, how is the device configured? Is there a device lock set on it or not? Uh, how is the device being used you know, just prior to the login? And so on. And then there is behavioral and sensor data. So the sensor data is uh, things from your accelerometer, the gyroscope, the touch sensors. And if you've been following the news coming out of Google and Apple, it seems like they're packing even more sensors into the devices. So if you can actually make sense of this data, you can verify not just what users enter, but also how they enter it. So and, and one point I want to emphasize here is you really want to use all the context that's available to you, uh, because the accuracy you get is significantly higher than if you'd left any one out. You know, and, and really, why would you not? Because you know, it's, you're getting all of this without bothering the user, so you might as well take advantage of it. All right, so how do you go from knowing that there is context to actually authenticating the user? So the first thing, you obviously need to collect the data. So, and for that, you need to know what you're collecting and how to go about it in a privacy-compliant way. Then you need to create a classifier for the behavioral and the sensor data. Combine that with intelligence that you've derived from the device and the location. And then using some thread-driven logic, decide whether you have a context match or not. So what we offer is uh, we'll do all the heavy lifting and give you this match result directly. And we do this in real time without uh, requiring the user to do anything differently, or even, for that matter, knowing that all of this is happening under the hood. All right, so Kumar is going to, in a bit, tell us uh, more about the location and device profiling. But um, I just want to say a few words about how we do the behavior profiling here, so how we rather collect the data. So as a user enters their credential, we are going to collect uh, things like the key press times, the, the, the time between the keys, uh, the touch pressure, the acceleration, and uh, a few other attributes. And we can, you can make this work with a pin as well, you know, any numeric code, even a short pin. Um, basically, you can think of it as a way of extracting more security out of whatever your credential is. The credential could even be something that you've actually swiped in. So this could be like your initials or a signature or uh, you know, any hand-drawn gesture. And for this, we actually get additional data. We get things like the swipe velocities and the swipe angle. Uh, we actually had uh, a client who wanted to use this for password resets. And, and if you think about it, that's a good use case, because users typically do not forget how they sign. Uh, but you know, there's muscle memory involved, so it's incredibly hard to forge. <coughs> All right, so with this, um, I want to move to a demo. So can we switch to the overhead? 
Cool, thanks. So we're going to be using an Android device here, and um, it's, uh, it'll work similarly on any device, you know, including a desktop. Uh, so basically what we have set up here is a demo app that includes our own SDK, and Kumar is going to be entering a credential, his password, for which we've already created a profile. And, and this is uh, a live demo, so we are actually collecting the data, sending it to our server, figuring out there's a match or not, and pushing back a result that we'll actually show you within the app itself. So do you want to go ahead? Cool. So, so basically, we got uh, an 84% similarity match. Um, now, I'm going to try. We're going to impersonate him. And so I'm going to try. I, you know, I know his password. Um, obviously, it's the same device, same location. So the, the only thing that's different in this case would be the behavior. Secure would be one end, right? Cool. All right. So it's it's not just the. You know, it's not just our rhythm, which was obviously different. You know, he, he's more familiar with the password, so he probably had a slightly faster speed. But it's also the, the touch sensors and the, you know, the, the sensor data, which will be different. Um, do you want to try it again? <laughs> All right. All right, so. OK, cool. Um, all right, can we also uh, do the touch, ver the gesture verification? Sure. So re recall, this is where we are um, looking at both the static and dynamic characteristics of his input gesture. Cool. So this is basically, it, it recognized his uh, input. Um, do you want to do it once more? All right, so I, I don't know if you noticed, but um, actually the, the, his two signatures weren't quite identical, and as they never will, uh, but the dynamic characteristics uh, are actually surprisingly consistent. So even if the static image doesn't quite match, you know, you, we still do, uh, we can, as you saw, we can still get a verification. Um, all right, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Kumar, and uh, he's going to just give you some more details and you know, the integration <coughs> aspect and talk about the verification accuracy and so on. So. Oh, and, and I just want to add one thing. So, uh, you know, VOBS is not rigged. We obviously want you guys to come and uh, try it out. So we have all this uh, in our booth. Or, you know, if you're leaving earlier, come by, uh, you know, just catch us anytime. So we'll be, you know, in the, the where that secret food room is up on the second floor. Right. All right. So can you switch back to the laptop, please? All right. Uh, so thanks, Anand. So I'm Kumar, and I'm the CTO and co-founder at Crisp. Uh, so Anand has given a good overview of what the problem space is and uh, what our core technology is. Uh, so what I like to do is to take it a step further and uh, maybe do a deeper dive into our solution. Um, also want to spend some time talking about uh, integration aspects and show how easy it is to integrate our solution as part of your existing authentication flow. Right, so one of the questions we get asked very commonly is uh, what happens if this touch verify that we just demoed doesn't work? Uh, well, in normal circumstances, uh, we get pretty good accuracy. Uh, we get between 85 and 95% accuracy, uh, depending upon how many samples were used for enrolling the user and um, how many samples are used to kind of train the model. Uh, but obviously, there are going to be exceptions. Um, for example, let's say the user is trying to log in while they're drinking coffee, uh, or the user injured their tapping finger. So that's going to throw the rhythm off, and in those cases, touch or five may not match. Uh, but that's still OK, uh, because we are using all the available context, all the available signals, along with the behavior, to kind of make the decision. So what are some of the uh, data and the signals that we look at? So one of the things that we do is what we call uh, device profiling. So as part of the device profile, uh, we derive a unique device ID. And uh, this is based on some very specific hardware and software characteristics of the underlying device. Uh, so this is generated dynamically and on the fly. So it's not like a cookie or a token that we just push to the device, and then that can be stolen or duplicated. Uh, another feature of the device profiling is that we also do what's called a person identifier. 
So this identifier helps us to kind of keep track of bad devices that we have seen in the system over the past across all our customers. So we kind of get to leverage the network effect. Uh, typically, we have observed that attackers uh, tend to run these automated script and um, they cycle through these known user ID password combinations that they are quite somehow and tested against known services. Now, this is clearly behavior that's not consistent with the normal user's behavior. Um, so by using the person identifier, we implement what we call login velocity checks, and we can protect against those kind of attacks. So in addition, we are using other device contexts uh, to analyze both positive and negative indicators of risk. Uh, just to give you an example, and um, I'll kind of briefly mention this, is one of the things we look at is, has the user set a pin or a password lock on the device? Uh, if a device lock has been set, it kind of raises the security bar, and we kind of factor that in, into our decision-making process. So the next thing that we do is what we call location profiling. And I'm sure most of you here are probably using geolocation in some form or the other. Uh, but the way we do location profiling is rather unique. Uh, we know that nowadays users are really concerned about privacy, and they rather that uh, their location not be tracked, and no API information be stored in the servers. Uh, so what we have done is we actually cryptographically blind that location information on the device before it's sent to our servers. So what, uh, in reality, this, our servers don't even know what the location of the user is. And it turns out that we don't need to. So we have developed and implemented these specialized algorithms uh, which create what we call safe zones for the user. And this is based on their past login history. Uh, so most users will have maybe three or four safe zones, maybe one around their home, one around their place of work, or a favorite coffee store where they like to access their service from. As long as the user comes in from within this blinded safe zone, then they are fine. And uh, the size of the safe zone is also configurable. So it can be as granular as 500 meters, or it can be as large as a city. So it's kind of up to you, and we provide that as a configurable parameter. Um, the algorithm that we use for deriving these safe zones is adaptive. So uh, we kind of give more preference to the newer locations, and we kind of age out the older locations over time. Right, so the bottom line is that we are combining all the device context, all the location context, and the behavior context uh, to derive this context math score. So this is in the nature of a kind of a binary result, and it's kind of like a pass or a fail. So we are kind of abstracting away all the complexity of the decision making, so you as a developer then can just use the result as is. But at the same time, we also provide you uh, with uh, the raw intelligence from each of the signals. So you also have the flexibility if you need to. Uh, and you can go and implement whatever business logic you need to make your authentication as permissive or as restrictive as it needs to be. So next, let's look at some uh, integration details on how to use our solution. So this is a very simple flow for straight up password authentication. Uh, so you have a user who is going to enter their user ID and password and is going to hit the login button. Uh, your application or your web service then is going to submit those credentials to your authentication server. And your authentication server is then going to verify that, and then you're going to re return either an authentication OK or authentication fail type of message. So now let's see what you need to do to use our service. Well, the first thing you need to do is to include our CRISP SDK as part of your application or as part of your uh, web service. Now, the user is going to enter their credentials same as before. And when they hit login, at that point, uh, your application needs to uh, call, a, call a CRISP API. So what this does is it allows our SDK to capture all the context and all the behavior aspect that we need, send it to a server, and in real time, uh, we return what is called a transaction ID. So now you submit your uh, user ID password along with this new transaction ID to your authentication service your authentication service is going to, again, verify this credential same as before. Um, and now at any point, uh, your server can then use a transaction ID and say, hey, give me the context math score for this transaction. And we provide a RESTful API uh, to get the math score. Uh, you can do this for every login, or you can choose to do this for only specific transactions that are high-risk transactions, depending upon what your business requirements are. Uh, if the context math score is passed, then, then you're fine. Uh, but if it's a fail, uh, then you might need to do some step-up authentication. 
uh, in the nature of like maybe security questions or maybe a one-time, like an OTP that you push to the device. Now, one thing I wanted to kind of point out over here is that we kind of engineered this solution uh, to be out of the critical path. And I'm sure that's really, really important for pretty much everyone. Um, so for whatever reason, let's say our service is inaccessible or unavailable, doesn't mean that your transactions cannot go through. Uh, you can still continue your transactions and just use your water primary authentication, like your password, user ID password that you're using currently. Uh, so we have SDKs for Android and iOS available. And for Android, it's an R file. For iOS, it's a framework. It's a really lightweight SDK, under one meg. Uh, we also have a JavaScript library available for desktop and mobile browsers. Um, so that was it. So just to kind of wrap up, so we are crisp. We enable smart authentication from smart devices. And we do it by leveraging context and user behavior and in a manner that's really transparent and um, completely uh, by and making, uh, making the user experience the same as they, what they are used to right now. Uh, so Lan mentioned uh, we have a live demo at our booth. So if this is of interest, uh, please come uh, talk to us. Thank you. OK, so we have time for a few questions. One that came in is, uh, could your solution be integrated into DocuSign to record signature behavior? Uh, actually, we did talk with the product manager at DocuSign. Um, and turns out they had like this Skunkworks project where which they did the same thing. And um, yeah, we definitely can integrate with DocuSign. Okay. Um, another one was, why not just use Touch ID instead of your solution? Right, so I think Alan kind of touched upon this uh, the earlier part of the talk. So I think our value proposition is that we want to provide the same uniform and the same comfortable kind of user experience for all users, all devices, and all platforms. Um, as a developer, you probably don't want to try and figure out a solution specifically for devices with fingerprints, one for devices with retinal scans, or one for devices which don't have either of those. Um, and it's really not an either or kind of a situation. Um, so if you have Touch ID enabled, that is context, and that is something we use in our decision making as well. OK. Um, do users need to download your app to use the service? No, no, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's basically an SDK or JavaScript. It's, uh, maybe the confusion is that we showed an app that, that was just a mock app, right? So it's, uh, there, is, there is no app. So in fact, we are basically transparent to the user. Uh, you know, we only interact with the, the app that's whole, that integrates us. OK. And then the last question is, does this work on desktops? Uh, yes, it does, and uh, it's uh, so that's where the, that's the JavaScript part of it. And uh, so, if, if the question is, uh, you know, where do we get the sensor data from? You know, we don't. You know, we don't get the pressure, but we do get the you know the timing data and you know the location and dev uh, the device information. So basically, actually, that is one of our value propositions. You know, so whether it's a desktop, whether it's a smartphone, we basically use whatever security mechanisms, whatever sensor data is there. So we kind of abstract that from you as the developer and, and give you, you, both you and the end user, a consistent user experience. Perfect.